Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Jay. I'm the Arts and Culture Director here at the Korea Society. And tonight we have Professor Minsu Kang. Minsu Kang is Associate Professor of History at the University of Missouri St. Louis, where he teaches actually European history. He's the author of Sublime Dreams of Living Machines, the Automaton in European Imagination that was published by Harvard University Press and a book of short stories titled Of Tales and Enigmas. Pers Professor Kang is also renowned for his translations of the story of Hong Gil Dong, which was the first book in the Penguin Classic series to be rendered from Korean and which we have for um, available for sale tonight. Um, and his translation of another classic Korean story, Chonuchi, which was included in the big book of classic fantasy. His latest book and the title of his talk tonight is um, Invincible and Righteous Outlaw, the Korean hero Hong Gil Dong in Literature, History, and Culture, which happens to be the first book length study of this novel in English. So please welcome Professor Min Soo Kang. Thank you for coming uh, to hear my talk, and thank you to Jay and uh, Korea Society as a whole for giving me this invitation. Um, so, um, what I'll, uh, as uh, Jay mentioned, um, what I did was I translated this very famous classic pre-modern Korean novel into English that became a Penguin classic, and uh, for reasons that I'll get into, I felt that that wasn't enough. I had to write an entire book. Uh, going over the significance of the um, of the work itself and its place in Korean literature and its Korean history and its significance um, and uh, and I'll explain why I, I explain why it was supposed to be this uh, one year long project of translation with a short introduction and I I felt compelled to compelled to write an entire book about it um, so. Um, there's a couple of things that I, I I'll talk about it and it has to do with historical myths. Um, so to begin with, I mean, this, this, for me, this all started so, so very long ago when I was an undergrad. And uh, uh, as I was um, taking various introductory classes on, uh, um, on historical uh, methodology, I took a class on um, cultural history. And one of the books that we read uh, is still one of my favorite uh, history books of all time. Um, the great English uh, historian Eric Hobsbawm's book, um, uh, Bandits, which came out in 1969. Um, and uh, in it, uh, he asks a very good question, which is that, um, you know, if we human beings um, came together and built civilizations, rather than living out in the wild and, you know, um, in small tribes, um, if we came together, you know, uh, in order to uh, keep ourselves safe um, and to have a... Um, uh, civilized society in which there are rules. Um, it is natural, of course, it is completely understandable that we would make great heroes out of the people who enforce those laws, uh, the great order givers. Um, but uh, Eric Hobsbawm uh, asks this really interesting question that if that is the case, why are we also completely fascinated with outlaws? Uh, people who disrupt those uh, rules. Um, and uh, why are we, in some cases, much more interested in figures like gangsters and uh, bandits and so on, even, uh, more so than uh, the lawgivers? Um, and uh, uh, and he, he spent the entire book explaining, the, uh, explaining that really, really good question. Um, and uh, what he, one of the approaches that he took was that he uh, gave a, a, a described a series of different types of outlaws, real and imagined, some of them just you know completely fictional, um, that people have paid a lot of attention to, and he, he uh, and he shows that there are different archetypes. Um, and uh, um, and there, there is a type of outlaw that he calls the noble robber. Now these are people who are clearly breaking laws, but they are actually admired for breaking laws. Uh, they actually uh, even, you know, idolize for breaking laws, and people uh, give a lot of support to them breaking laws. Um, and uh, so, in his description, and in, when when Hobbes was trying to figure out why why these uh, this particular type of lawbreakers are idolized, um, he goes into specific descriptions of a typical noble robber, and uh, and he says there are nine 
uh, general characteristics that are attached to it, the noble robber type. And uh, as I read this, um, I'm going to ask you, like, who comes up in your mind immediately when I describe? Um, number one, uh, the noble robber begins his career of outlawry, not by crime, but as a victim of injustice or through being persecuted by the authorities for some act which they, but not the customs of the people, regard as criminal. Okay. Second, uh, the noble robber rights wrongs. Third, the noble robber takes from the rich and gives to the poor. Fourth, the noble robber never kills except in self-defense or just revenge. Fifth, if the noble robber survives, he returns to his people as an honorable citizen and member of the community. Indeed, he never actually leaves the community. Uh, number six, uh, the noble robber is admired, helped, and supported by the people. Number seven, he, the noble robber dies invariably, invariably only through treason, uh, since no decent member of the community would help the authorities against him. Uh, the characteristic number eight is that the noble robber, at least in theory, is invisible and invulnerable. And finally, number nine, he is not the enemy of the king or the emperor, who is the fount of justice, but only of the local gentry or clergy, or other oppressors, right? Who? Robin. Robin Hood, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's the most famous one. I mean, this is just basically a description of uh, who Robin Hood is. Um, now, the brilliance of this book, I mean, the, the, the aspect of this book that really blew my mind is that what Eric Hobsbawm uh, shows is that that noble robber type, uh, like, like Robin Hood, you can find all over the world. There's a local Robin Hood in East Africa, there's one in Eastern Europe, there's one in China, there's one in uh, India. Uh, pretty much every culture has a legend of the noble robber who seems like basically the same guy, right? I mean, has, has very similar stories. Um, and, uh, um, and, and, uh, and so I did that, that aspect of it is as famous. Um, and it's not, it's not because of the influ Western influence of the Robin Hood figure. I mean, these were ancient figures that's been you know, embedded in this culture. Um, now, um, when I read this, as a Korean, my first thought was like, this is Hong Gil Dong. <laughs> I mean, my first thought wasn't Robin Hood. My second thought was Robin Hood. This is Hong Gil Dong, right? I mean, this is the great hero that I grew up with, and mostly from uh, the comic book versions, uh, and also there was an animated film of this, right? Uh, and this is a very famous um, uh, figure from the 1960s. Uh, and, and, and this figure, this cartoon drawing of the Hong Gil Dong figure is so famous that for the vast majority of Koreans, when they think of Hong Gil Dong, that's what they see. This sturdy young man with a blue, uh, a blue coat and uh, with a sword and, and so on. Um, and so um, he is, uh, all Koreans know who Hong Gil Dong is. Um, I mean, just that it's, it's kind of hard to imagine an English person not knowing who Robin Hood is. Right? Uh, it's kind of hard to imagine a uh, you know, Korean not knowing who Hong Gil Dong because he's just so famous. And in many ways, without too much exaggeration, you could say that the original work that his uh, story is based on, the Joseon Dynasty novel, the story of Hong Gil Dong, um, is probably on that level the most, single most influential fiction that comes out of the Joseon Dynasty, uh, just, just, be, uh, just because of the sheer influence of it. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, one of the ways you could gauge uh, how influenced it is, influential Hong Gil Tong is, the name Hong Gil Tong is used like John Doe in the West, in the sense that um, if you see a form to, that you need to fill out in Korea, and at the place where you're supposed to put your name, just as an example, people put in Hong Gil Tong. <laughs> All right, so anywhere a name goes, names supposed they just use. Um, I, I, I'm not kidding you, but I've been to a funeral parlor where they show a bunch of different grave, uh, you know, uh, sort of gravestones and tombstones that they have, and they have Hong Gil Dong in it, right? Where the name goes, right? Not because the name is associated in any way with death or funeral or anything like that, but that's that just John Doe, right? Um, so now, uh, I, I was, I mean, this figure is so famous that um, I have actually at that point, as an undergrad, had never read the story of Hong Gil Dong. To this day, the vast majority of Koreans have never read the story of Hong Gil Dong, right? But they all know the story because it's so famous, right? Uh, and uh, m much of my familiarity at that time came from the comic books, children's comic books, and so on. Um, and it's not that different from, um, you know, I, I saw this really uh, uh, hilarious document, uh, travel documentary where this film crew went to the town of La Mancha in Spain, 
uh, where Don Quixote takes place, right? Um, and you go to La Mancha, and the entire place is a tourist trap for Don Quixote enthusiasts. Right? There's Don Quixote stuff everywhere. Don Quixote statue, Don Quixote stuff, windmills, you know, that you can go to and so on, right? Uh, and uh, um, at the end of the documentary, they did something funny where they started asking people in the village, uh, when was the last time you read Don Quixote? They couldn't find a single person in the village who actually read Don Quixote, right? And, uh, um, and, and one of the reasons for that is that they're so familiar with the story, they don't think they actually need to read it, right? Uh, because it's been represented so many times you know, uh, in movies and TV and so on. And, and you know, the scene's are iconic. And I think for most Koreans, they feel that way. Um, now, one of the most uh, you know, famous scenes that all Koreans are familiar with is the great lamentation of Hong Yil Tong. Right, because he was his father was a noble Yangban, a uh, Yangban nobleman, but his mother was a, a servant girl in that house, so he was an illegitimate child, and uh, uh, and uh, you know by law, not only is he not treated as the proper son of the nobleman, but as he laments, I cannot even address my father as father, and I cannot even address my brother as brother, right? Because he has a half brother who's who is legitimate, right? Um, now that scene, everybody, uh, everybody in Korea knows. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with this uh, story, um, uh, just just a very very brief synopsis. Um, it's 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 basically an adventure story like Robin Hood, um, and it begins in the household of a uh, very very uh, illustrious nobleman. Um, who, uh, for under a very complicated situation, ends up uh, impregnating a servant girl in his household, and she gives birth to this terrifically talented uh, young man named Hong Gil Tong. Um, but because of Joseon Dynasty laws at that time, he is although he grows up in a uh, nobleman's household and he gets the education of a nobleman's son, he is not allowed to pursue. Uh, government service. Uh, he's not allowed to take the test, so he'll never become a government official or government military official, uh, mil military officer, and serve the nation. And therefore, he is full of resentment. And uh, finally, he, as a young man, after um, his stepmother tries to arrange for his murder, he leaves home and comes across a group of bandits. And he immediately takes over control over them. And he turns out to be not only a kick-ass warrior but a master magician who can create a bunch of different uh, you know, um, uh, replicas of himself. He can fly around in clouds. He can do, I mean, he he's basically you know, becomes invincible. Right? Um, and uh, and after, uh, after doing all the kind of Robin Hoody kind of stuff, right, uh, where he steals from corrupt people, although he doesn't do a lot of giving to the poor people. I mean, he just, <laughs> but he, uh, but he, uh, um, he intercepts uh, bribery and punishes uh, you know, corrupt noblemen and so on. And uh, finally, until the, even the king hears about it, and he sends policemen after him. And, uh, uh, and when, confronted, uh, when, uh, when confronted by the authorities, he says, uh, all I wanted to do with all my powers was to serve this country. But because of my illegitimate birth, not only could I not serve the country, uh, I, I could not even call my father father, and, you know, and so on, right? Um, and, uh, and so finally, he basically comes up, uh, makes a deal with the king that if the king would make him, or give him an important post in the government, that he would spare him the embarrassment of having an ex-bandit as one of his government officials, and he would leave, right? So, uh, so the king does give him the post of the uh, minister of uh, military affairs, at which point he takes all of his bandits and their families, and they all leave Joseon Dynasty Korea, and they go to an island where uh, they form their own kingdom, and Hong Gil Tong becomes a king, and he takes over another island and um, and it, it ends with him retiring his position as a king and giving it to his, uh, his son and so on. Right? Um, so that's, that's basically the story. Um, now, uh, this is um, the reason why I uh, got really interested in this is because um, in 1968, uh, only in 1968, the, uh, the first translation of the story of Hong Tong was made into English by a man named Marshall Pill. And... Uh, um, and it, it really dissatisfied me for a bunch of different reasons. Um, the, the story did just somehow did not seem complete. It just sort of, there were these plot ideas that just never really um, uh, came to anything. And there were a couple of mistakes in the translations and so on, right? Um, so at that time, uh, I decided that, okay, this is, uh, one day I'm going to do a proper translation. 
right? I'll take this on, right? Um, and this was in our undergrad, right? Um, more years than I care to admit passes since then. <laughs> I went into uh, uh, not Korean history, but European history for my PhD and uh, got a job. And it really had to wait until I got tenure. <laughs> Uh, after I, you know, found a place as a European historian to say, okay, now I got tenure, I can do whatever I want, right? Let's do this, right? It's a long time coming, right? Um, so um, I, uh, I went to this, I, so I started looking into this. So uh, I started looking for a good manuscript to work on uh, for the translation. And, uh, and also I started collecting, you know, very recent scholarly articles and books written about Hong Gil-dong to see you know, what contemporary scholars were saying. And, uh, um, and I was actually shocked uh, that this project, because, it's, I mean, it's not that long. I mean, it's like, a, it's like in, in the Penguin edition, it's, it's, it's about 70 pages. Um, I, I thought this was going to take me about a year, uh, do this translation and then do a good introduction and that'll be it, right? Uh, and at that time, I, I, you know, I, I, the idea that this becoming a Penguin classic was really not beyond my imagination. Uh, but um, so, you know, and then I can get back to my you know, European history stuff. Uh, but as I was doing research on it, I, I was shocked. I was just completely shocked at what a complex project this was going to be. Um, because first of all, there are 34 surviving versions of the story of Hong Gil Dong. And they are of different lengths. Uh, the episodes in one that doesn't appear in others, uh, there's, some, um, there's some idiosyncratic um, you know, variations and so on. Um, and uh, in fact, the longest one, uh, the Pilsa 89 version, which I ended up translating, is five times longer than the shortest. And one of the shortest version is what the previous translation ha handled, which is why it was, it sort of kind of didn't, you know, uh, it, it just felt incomplete, right? And, and I'll tell you again why there are different versions of it. Um, so one of the big questions that I had to face was like, so I want to translate the story of Hong Gil-dong, which one, <laughs> right? And so I had to do research into, you know, which one would be the best one to do. Um, and then uh, once I started reading the uh, scholarship about the story of Hong Gil-dong, um, I was even more shocked to find that almost everything that most Koreans, vast majority of Koreans, think that they know about the significance of the story of Hong Yutong is just completely wrong. Uh, they seem to be a series of myths that have been fairly effectively uh, exploded by scholars and historians, um, but really hasn't seeped into uh, general uh, consciousness about them. And uh, um, and these um, and 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 you know and this is, and also I'll, I'll I'll talk a little bit about why, despite the fact that these have been revealed to be myth, that they still persist. Um, so um, there are four main myths uh, that I I discovered to be myths rather than uh, historical facts. That uh, I mean, if you ask most Koreans, they'll 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 think that the, the, these are the sort of the important things that you have to know about the story of Hong Yutong. One that this was the very first Korean fiction, work of fiction, prose fiction, to be written in Hangul, the, the, the native Korean phonetic script that was invented by King Sejong in the 15th century. Right? It, it's just, just not true. This is, this is just, uh, or, or rather, there's just absolutely no evidence for it. Number two, uh, that the story of Hong Gil Tong is, was written probably in the early 17th century by a specific writer by the name of Ho Gyun, uh, who died in 1618. He was executed for tre treason. Um, again, this is highly unlikely. I mean, it is so unlikely that this is in all probably not to be the case. Uh, Ho Gyun was not the writer of uh, the, the, um, the story of Hong Gil-dong that exists today. Uh, number three, that Ho Gyun, uh, the writer, wrote it in order to protest um, Joseon Dynasty laws concerning illegitimate children, which is what Hong Yutong was, right? That, that, that was his main purpose. And it, this is related to number four, the, the number four myth, that Ho Gyun uh, was writing this work because he was, he was a kind of a Joseon Dynasty proto-socialist, possibly a proto-democrat, uh, who was prote protesting against feudalism itself uh, and, uh, and, and the feudal order. 
and that he wrote the story of Hong Geok-dong about this rebel who breaks laws and makes fool out of the king and punishes corrupt noblemen as a kind of a political manifesto of his radical ideas. And it was because of those radical ideas that he was uh, executed for treason at the end. Right? Um, it is just, just complete nonsense. Uh, I mean, if you really look at uh, Huggins' life and his ideology and the circumstances under which he was executed, there's nothing to do with it. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll talk about why those four ideas is just sort of deeply, deeply embedded uh, in most Koreans' perception of the work when it turns out that they are all uh, myths, right? Um, so, but before we get to that, a couple of steps, a couple of historical steps um, to go into systematically so we'll have some understanding of where these um, ideas come from. Hong Gil Dong uh, was a real life historical figure. Uh, he was a bandit um, who operated in the, uh, the southwestern province of Chungcheong, Chungcheong-do, and, uh, um, and there are real records in the royal records that he was captured in the year 1500. Right? And uh, uh, there's not, I, I mean, beyond that, uh, I mean, I, I, I found and poured through every single uh, historical record of this, of the real life Hong Giltong. Uh, it doesn't yield very much. We don't know where he's from, uh, why he did what he did, what kind of a background that he com came from. And, uh, um, and we don't even know uh, when exactly he was executed. We just know that he was captured in 1500. So we can guess that he was executed fairly soon after, uh, possibly in the same year. Um, but one thing is clear is that um, he did tremendous amount of damage. Uh, apparently lots of people uh, were hurt by his actions. Um, and at that time, um, he was regarded as this horrific villain uh, who brought a lot of suffering on the people. In other words, um, if there was, and there's no evidence for this whatsoever, if there was an oral tradition of discussing Hong Giltong as a kind of a hero or a Robin Hood-like figure who was beloved by the people, those legends would have come out a long time since 1500. Because in around 1500, uh, there was still a lot of evidence that he and his actions were greatly resented by the people. Right? Now, um, so um, the other problem, uh, the, the, and, and then what happened was that Sometime after 1618, uh, when Hogyun, the purported author of the story of Hogyun, uh, Hong Giltong, was executed, um, a, another writer uh, named Yi Shik uh, made a commentary uh, in one of his writings about Hogyun. And, uh, and he wrote that Hogyun wrote a work called The Story of Hong Giltong. And uh, uh, in imitation of Water Margin, which is the great Chinese epic of bandits, uh, it's like thousands of pages long, um, and so on. So he, in other words, Hogyun loved this story, the, the, this Chinese version of you know, Hong Giltong's story, um, so much that he decided to write a Korean version of it and used Hong Giltong uh, as the hero. Right? And uh, uh, now, if Ishik had never said that one sentence that Hogyun wrote the story of Hong Giltong, nobody, no, but no, no Korean would ever thought that he, uh, Hogyun would have written it. Um, but here's the thing, um, Ishik emerged as one of the most significant writers of mid Joseon dynasty period. His writings were lauded. I mean, his, <clears throat> and his collections of, <clears throat> his collected writings were really like, you know, required reading for um, uh, Joseon dynasty writers. And <clears throat> as a result, this notion that his, te his former teacher, Hogyun, uh, wrote the story of Hong Giltong, got repeated over and over again throughout the Joseon dynasty. Um, but here's the thing, I mean, but, but I'll, I'll get to that point. So this is where the idea that Hogyun wrote uh, the story of Hong Giltong uh, comes from. And then what happened was that um, in, um, in, in 1930, uh, during the Japanese imperial era, a Korean nationalistic um, uh, uh, literary scholar by the name of Kim Tae-jun, he wrote a book called Joseon Sosolsa, which means the history of Joseon dynasty fiction. So just on just prose fiction, not poetry, not nonfiction. Um, and, uh, um, and it is apparent that he loved, loved, loved the story of Hong Giltong. And there, um, he, using also his knowledge of Ishik saying that Hogyun wrote the story of Hong Giltong, he, for the first time, attributed uh, Hogyun as the author of the story of Hong Giltong. 
Well, actually, he wasn't the first one. Um, it's kind of ironic that the first person who did that was actually a Japanese person by the name of Takahashi Toru, uh, who was Kim Tae-jun's uh, professor. And he was the first one who sort of unquestioningly thought that, well, this very popular Joseon Dynasty novel called The Story of Hong Gil-dong exists. And here is a record all the way back from the 17th century of this very famous Joseon Dynasty writer, Yi Shik, saying that Ho Gyun wrote this, wrote a work entitled The Story of Hong Gil Tong. So he just connected it without really thinking that much about it. And this Japanese scholar, Takahashi, did that, and his student, Kim Tae Jun, did this, right? Um, okay, so this is, these are the historical steps that took to creating this myth about uh, the story of Hong Gil Tong. So, um, so this couple, okay, now here's where it becomes problematic. Here's why that entire uh, edifice of these myths uh, starts cracking to pieces. Number one, um, as I said, there's this thought, there's no less than 34 different versions of the story of Hong Gil-dong um, in existence, um, and every single one of them are either from the 20th century or late 19th century. Nothing precedes that. Um, now, some of them don't have dates, uh, uh, many of them don't have dates, but the earliest one that does uh, dates from 1893, and the latest one from 1936. Uh, now we do know that it was it wa the, Hong Gil the story of Hong Gil-dong was around, and people were reading it before the 1890s because, in fact, there's a 1876 record uh, where somebody um, writes a writes a brief summary of it. So we know that it, it's 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 from uh, the, uh, it could be from er earlier period. Um, in not a single one of those 34 manuscripts is Hogyun ever mentioned as its author, not even in a marginal note, right? Uh, there's no mention of an author at all, right? Uh, it is, I mean, they, they exist as if it was written by an anonymous writer, and I'll get into reasons uh, for that later. Um, and also, this is even more troubling, is that despite the fact that Yi Shik said that Hogyun wrote the story of Hong Tong, and that statement, because Yi Shik became famous, was repeated over and over again. Uh, so a bunch of Joseon Dynasty writers said that, you know, um, Hogyun wrote a you know, novel about this bandit. Um, there is zero, zero evidence that any Joseon Dynasty person prior to the 19th century has actually read the story of Hong Gil Dong. Zero. Nobody talking about what the story is about, uh, nobody giving a critique of its contents, nothing. Uh, even Ishik himself, when he says that, you know, Hogan wrote this, uh, it is no, there's, there's nothing in his statement that says that he actually knew what the story was about. He knew that it was about a bandit because Hong Gil Tong was a real life bandit, right? But that's it. Not a single uh, mention of this anywhere. Um, now, the theory is, uh, one of the theories that, uh, that have been presented about this complete absence of any kind of discussion about the contents of the story of Hong Gil Dong before the 19th century is that it was a dangerous work, right, about a rebel uh, who makes fun of, uh, who makes fool of the king and who uh, messes with the Yangban nobility and so on, and so nobody wants to talk about it. Yeah, but there's no evidence for this whatsoever. This is just uh, another kind of wishful thinking. Um, I mean, as a scholar, if there's no evidence, you just say there's no evidence and then you just leave it at that. You don't just, you don't just make up stuff right? because, and say that you can't disprove it. You know? um, so, and the other problem is that, um, in other words, um, we, we have never found uh, a manuscript with Hogan's name written on it. And before Hogan died, he actually edited his, his own collected writings. And there's been several collected writings of Hogyun since then. Not a single one of them includes the story of Hong Gil Tong. Right? Uh, and Hogyun never mentions uh, him has, has, has ever written it. Uh, written it. Um, now, so here's the thing. I mean, what is within the realm of possibility is that Hogyun in the 17th century did write a work called the story of Hong Gil Tong that is completely unrelated to the work that exists today. Right. Uh, and and and, then, uh, and that that work by Hogan may have gotten lost, right? But what exists today is something that was written significantly in a uh, in a significantly later period that has nothing to do with Hogan, right? Um, now, um, but here is um, the biggest problem. I mean, the uh, biggest problem with this narrative is that um, this uh, this is another thing that comes from Kim Tae Jun's uh, 1930. 1931 work, uh, the story of, uh, I mean, the, the, the um, history of Korean uh, fiction, is that uh, he presents a theory 
uh, about where the story of Hong Gyo-dong belongs. And his theory goes something like this. Um, Korea suffered through, uh, Joseon Dynasty Korea suffered through uh, two major calamities in the late 16th and early 17th century. The first is the Japanese invasion of 1592 to 98. Uh, and then, uh, in the following century, the two invasions by the Manchus uh, on the eve of the establishment of the Qing Dynasty in 1627 and 1636, uh, and, uh, which ended with a humiliating, humiliating uh, defeat by the Joseon Dynasty forces and, you know, um, and surrender. Um, now, uh, the theory is that that brought about such calamity in Joseon Dynasty society that the common people were very angry at the Yangban nobility for having messed up the situation and brought so much calamity down on them. And as a result, they, they demanded a different kind of literature uh, from the kind of literature that the Yangban was producing. And the, uh, and the kind of uh, literature that they were um, uh, demanding was works for commoners uh, that is realistic, that is closer to re what real life is, because the kind of work that the Yangban were producing were highly moralistic, highly stylized, and uh, in slavish imitation of Chinese examples, and so on and so on. And uh, so uh, common people are saying, we want something that's more realistic, that, that says something to us. And it's, it's a form of rejecting elite values in elite culture. And as a result, um, there was a proliferation of this new literature for commoners and uh, in the uh, early 17th century, uh, in, in, in the aftermath of the Japanese and the Manchu invasions. Right? Um, and this idea of this creation of a commoners literature in the early 17th century is something that has been repeated over and over again, not only in Korean, uh, not only in Korea and Korean textbook, but in English language, histories of Korean literature, this is um, you know, said over and over again. There's not a sh single shred of evidence for this whatsoever, uh, that there was this massive proliferation of commonest literature, right? Um, and, uh, but uh, there's, there's just no, uh, I mean, and, and, and also this idea uh, is completely implausible because of the low literacy rates of the commoners at that time, right? And, uh, uh, and, it's, uh, and, and the idea that there would be any kind of a marketing publishing, publishing system for so few people, um, it's, it's completely implausible. And they, I mean, at the end of the day, there's just no documentary evidence whatsoever for this kind of thing have happened. Uh, but in, in a way, for Kim Tae-jun, who came out with this completely baseless theory, it's a way in which it explains um, how the story of Hong Gil-dong came about. So you have this Yangban no noble writer, Ho Gyun, who unbeknownst to himself is a kind of a proto-socialist, proto-democrat, uh, who care about the people, who care about the common people and hated people of his own class. Right? Um, and therefore, uh, he gave the common people a great gift in the story of Hong Gil-dong. Right, to inspire them to rebel, to inspire them to ask for a more just society, and he made a hero out of this outlaw. Right, uh, and so that's 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 the way in which uh, it's uh, idea, but uh, that's the way in which this idea is justified. Um, again, no evidence for this whatsoever. There's zero evidence. Um, and by the way, um, the idea also is that th this also intertwined the idea that um, unlike the noble Yangban who wrote pretty much all of their literary writings in classic Chinese, that one of the ways in which Ho Gyun made this to a gift for the common people is he wrote them in Hangul, which is the easily uh, uh, learned uh, phonetic script. Um, and, uh, but the thing is, though, the problem is that um, King Sejong the Great of the 15th century who invented uh, the Korean script, which wasn't called Hangul at the time. Um, it was, uh, that, that, that's a modern term. Um, you know, he's, he's lauded in Korea and they make really silly TV dramas like <laughs> about him and all that. Uh, but one thing people hardly ever mention is that his desire to create the phonetic strip that was easily learned by everybody and therefore spread literacy throughout the country was a huge failure. It did not work. It had virtually no impact on the rate of literacy in this country whatsoever, uh, mainly because the nobility completely rejected its use uh, and refused to teach it. Um, and frankly, uh, common people just did not even have the wherewithal to learn this uh, uh, script. Um, 
there was indeed, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it is very easily learned and so on. Um, in fact, um, the most common term for what is now called Hangul is, was Anmun, which literally meant the vulgar script. It's, it's the nobility, Yangban nobility's uh, term, the vulgar script. Now, it didn't completely die out. Uh, there were certain sections of Korean society where they started using it. Um, like translators found it extremely useful because it, it, it present, represented sound. Uh, noble women used it to le write letters and diaries among each other because, um, and, and therefore Amgul, which means woman's writing, became another derogatory term for this, right? Uh, but, but it was, I mean, it had no, uh, it had no impact, zero impact on the overall literacy of the country as a whole. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore, uh, the idea that in the 17th century, all of a sudden there will be this proliferation of commoners literature written in Hangul just does not make any sense. And not only does it not make any sense, again, zero evidence. It's just complete and utter lack of evidence for this, right? Um, so now, um, you may be thinking that if, if you're, especially if you're uh, somewhat familiar with this, um, if none of this is true, <laughs> if this wasn't written in the 17th century, it wasn't written by Hogyun, it wasn't written as a, a protest against Joseon Dynasty feudalism, then, then what, what the hell is it, right? Where does it come from? I mean, what is this history? Um, well, thanks to the uh, um, work of uh, contemporary scholars, um, particularly there's a professor at uh, Yonsei University named Lee Yun Suk who's done incredible work on this topic, uh, we do have a much more plausible theory about the origins of this book and uh, and what its meaning is. Um, and it's 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 uh, in itself it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Um, now, um, the 18th century. Uh, so the 1700s for Joseon Dynasty was a completely fascinating period. Uh, in many ways, to me, uh, one of the most uh, fascinating period because um, uh, it's a time of uh, unprecedented uh, period of peace and prosperity. Um, one of it was one reason for that was thanks to um, the fact that it had rain, really long reigns of three excellent monarchs. Um, King Sukjong, and then after a very brief and you know inconsequential role of King Hyongjong, King Yongjo, and King Jongjo, who lived uh, all three of very long periods, um, and these were remarkable, remarkable kings. I mean, they didn't mess around. They they really ran the country like professionals, um, and uh, uh, and they uh, you know uh, they um, they um, instituted advanced uh, agricultural techniques, and there was a great deal of prosperity, advancement in learning, um, and, and, and a fairly significant amount of social mobility. Um, now, they were allowed to do this because East Asia in general was in peace at the time, uh, because the Japanese uh, Tokugawa shogunate was in an isolationist mode, uh, so they, you know, Korea didn't have to worry about them, and the northern people in the borders were kept under strict control by the Qing Dynasty uh, lordship, so uh, not much to worry about in terms of foreign. So that allowed the Korean kings to concentrate on um, uh, domestic affairs, and these three men did it spectacularly. And one of the things that happened was that as a result of this prosperity, unprecedented amount of social mobility of commoners uh, uh, either gaining Yangban status or, um, uh, or even if they don't, just gaining enough money and wherewithal to get themselves educated. So um, when the Joseon dynasty was first founded in the uh, late 14th century, historians think that the percentage of Yangban noblemen was about 5%. Uh, that increased incrementally over the next uh, over the next centuries, um, so that by the end of the Japanese War, um, they think it's about fifteen. By the time by the end of King Yongjo's period, it has jumped to about thirty percent. Almost a third of the Korean population will now identify themselves as Yangban noblemen, and uh, um, and and one of the things that they uh, one of the things that they will uh, allow them to do is that they gained literacy, uh, a significant um, you know gain in literacy. So. What Kim Tae-jun thought that uh, happened uh, in the, uh, the late 16th and early 17th century, he was off about 200 years. <laughs> and uh, um, and so, um, so, so, so at, as a result, there was enough audience for uh, commercial fiction, uh, for commoners. Um, and uh, uh, and, and you, it, they were all written by commoners, uh, anonymous, because they weren't really uh, doing it for fame. Um, and. Uh, and what they would do is that um, first uh, it would be written by uh, a brush, 
and it would be rented out, different uh, uh, books would be rented out, or it, it would be performed in the streets. Um, if that proved to be successful, it, the printers took them out, and there was no copyright or anything like that, so these guys just grab one of these and just print them out, right? Uh, the reason why there's so many different versions of it is that once a work like uh, uh, work became popular, the printers would start publishing shorter and shorter versions to save on the paper cost. Right? And therefore, uh, if you have a same work with multiple versions, the longer it is, it's probably the older. Right? I mean, the, you know, uh, so because it goes through this. Uh, and there were many different kinds. Uh, there were adventure stories like the story of uh, Chan Uchi and the story of Zhou Ung, as a Chinese general, a uh, story of the female magician uh, Lady Bak, love stories like a uh, story of Chun Hyang, historical story like, uh, like the story of uh, the Japanese invasion of Queen In Hyun, and family dramas. Um, but um, it, w one of the important things is that um, and, and this is really important for the scholarship of Korean literature. Um, when we th tend to think of Korean fiction, classic Korean fiction, we tend to all lump them together as everything that ha were written prior to the, uh, prior to the uh, 20th century. But there are actually two parallel uh, types of Korean fiction, one written by Yangban, the nobleman. And, uh, and for Yangban, they were written not for mass consumption, but for other Yangban readers, and they weren't written for profit, because there, there wasn't really any money in it, but for reputation, to just demonstrate what a great writer I am. Um, and, uh, um, and, and, with many, and usually they have very definitive moralistic meanings and allusions to especially Chinese literature, Chinese history, and so on and so on. The commoner, uh, the, 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 uh, the popular fiction written for commoners, they're written for profit. Uh, and they usually, they, I mean, the moralistic message and all that's there, but it's not as important as just emotional attachment, excitement, and, 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 uh, and fast action and so on. So if you read those two, I mean, you can see that they're, they're very, very different kinds of works, right? Um, now, uh, the story of Hong Giltong, which one does it belong, right? Um, so you, you, you check it out by doing a comparative analysis. Um, the story of Hong Giltong does not in any way resemble the kind of works that Yang Ban were producing. But you put it side by side with 19th century popular fiction in terms of its structure, in terms of its subject matter, and how it fits right in there, right? This is a 19th century work, right? I mean, there's, no, there's, there's just no doubt about it. It came out of the 19th century. Um, but uh, just to go quickly, I need to wrap it up. Um, just uh, very briefly, um, Here's the reasons why, despite the fact that if you just do the comparative analysis, it's very, it's, it's very obvious that this was written probably sometime in the middle of the 19th century by an anonymous commoner writer for profit. And uh, uh, even if the nobleman Hong Yun did write it, did write a version called, uh, uh, did write a work called The Story of Hong Yun Dong, this is not it, right? This is, it would have been a completely different word. Uh, but there, there, I, I think there's three reasons why uh, we still like to persistently, uh, Koreans um, generally persistently hold on to this idea, is that, first of all, the work by Kim Tae-jun on the history of Chosen Dynasty, that's really, really influential. I mean, that's the first work to really write about Chosen Dynasty literature, and, it's, and that kind of influence is really hard to shake. And, as, and also, uh, frankly, there's lots of scholars who are unwilling to like, correct their work. <laughs> And because this is the basis upon which they, they built their um, entire theory. Um, but also, the pro another problem is that uh, the Korean education system's way in which teaching literature is very, very problematic. They don't have students read the entire work, but they have like one paragraph, and then they are forced to memorize a series of facts. Right? And the, some of the facts include the story of Hong Giltong was the first work written in Hangul. It was written by Hong Yun. It was written in order to, you know, and, and, when, and these guys just, uh, just memorize these facts so they can put in the right answer for, uh, for their college entrance exams, right? Um, and, but the, uh, the, the other thing is that I think, um, I think there's a significant amount of elitism involved, right? I think this is one of the most significant works of Korean literature. I think Koreans would prefer to think this is a work of a highly educated, Nobleman uh, with you know with with just fancy you know educa educational background and the idea of a anonymous commoner writing this for profit just somehow seems cheap to them right and you know and by the way uh, you know there's uh, I'm sure you heard this this conspiracy theory is about maybe Shakespeare didn't write his works right um, I it's it's a huge freaking waste of time. <laughs> 
<laughs> because uh, it's, it's, it's complete nonsense because we know exactly how, how well uh, Shakespeare was educated and so on. But I think, I think there is elitism going on because, you know, Shakespeare came from the middle classes. I mean, uh, and so when you look at like conspiracy theories about who could have actually written it, they're all noblemen like Francis Bacon and Edward de Vere and so on, right? Um, but the thing is, I, I just want to put this. Um, to me, this is, that kind of elitism is both completely understandable, but at the same time weird because we now live in a democratic country uh, where we put a great deal of uh, value to the people's expression. And this is quintessential an expression of, um, the, uh, of the common culture of the people. And, uh, and just because it was written for profit for a market doesn't mean it's less literature. Shakespeare was for the people. Um, some of the greatest writers of the 19th century, Charles Dickens, you know, Honoré de Balzac were popular writers. Um, and as a result, um, what I see as a historian uh, is um, really a voice of the common people of the 19th century because 19th century, unlike the 18th century, became very, very problematic for the Korean people. The kingdom starts falling to pieces. They want any, uh, you know, all the kings proved to be horribly, inc uh, um, horribly incompetent and so on. And it was in that period of anxiety about the future and about, you know, the, the falling uh, apart of the state that they live in that they came to idolize this outlaw hero. Uh, and, uh, and as a result, uh, that I, I think that's, that's the proper way to uh, um, go about it. Now, um, so that's, that's the gist of what I want to say. I just want to say one last thing before I... Uh, open up for questions is that, um, you know, this, this is a very interesting time to be a Korean in America right now, right? Because uh, for, especially for a lot of young people, all things Korean has become kind of hip. <laughs> people are listening to, pop, you know, K-pop and, you know, watching Korean movies and so on. And, uh, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that, um, you know, my translation also came at the right time. And uh, I cannot tell you how grateful that I am uh, at my wonderful editor at Penguin, uh, Sam Raim, and uh, the whole team there, and to get this out because um, I regularly, you know, get pictures from classrooms uh, of not only Korean Americans getting to know this great, wonderful hero uh, who was so important to me as a child, but also just Americans finding out about this about about the Korean Robin Hood, and uh, um, and you know, I I, I like to. Uh, 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 usually, it's just to, uh, in a fun way, describe Hong Gil Tong as the one genuine Korean superhero. <laughs> and uh, uh, he'll be a great addition to uh, the, uh, the Avengers, for instance. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so uh, I am very grateful to Penguin Classics. Um, and, uh, um, and, and I'm, I'm also really grateful to, uh, to the University of Hawaii for giving me the opportunity to give um, the full account what may be the true significance of the story of Hong Gil Tong. Thank you very much. You talked about uh, elite literature and um, the theory, and uh, um, I don't know enough uh, to uh, contradict that. Mm -hmm. um, how much uh, oral uh, uh, storytelling mm -hmm. uh, is there in Korea, or has has there been? Yeah. Are there stories that have come down for a thousand years, or uh, right, okay. something like that? Yeah. Um, uh, there's a couple of uh, ways to answer the question. Yes, I mean, there, there's, there's uh, significant evidence of strong oral tradition of storytelling and so on. And um, one of the theories that have been presented is that since the um, execution of the real-life Hong Gil Tong, that it must have taken this kind of weird process in which the villain got turned into a hero and the story must have been told here and there. And somehow you reach the ears of this nobleman named Ho Gyun who decided to transform into great literature and so on, right? Uh, now, uh, yes, like, like all cultures, uh, the old tradition, uh, in, when there's low literacy rate, especially among the com common people, the way, the way in which story get passes through oral means and so on and so on, right? Um, and, uh, um, and it has been assumed that the uh, story of Hong Gil Tong has been, had that origin. Um, zero historical evidence, zero. <laughs> Uh, no commentary by anybody saying that I heard this oral story here and there and so on, right? I mean, it's, I mean that doesn't make it beyond the realm of possibility, but uh, it is also possible that a 19th century writer just heard about Hong Gil Tong from somewhere with there being no oral tradition and just decided to construct this really cool 
uh, novel out of it. Um, and you know, because I mean, the, the problem is that there's there's so much of this kind of um, people just coming out with theories that can that uh, not only are undefended by evidence, but they cannot be defended by evidence because there's just not enough material to a certain one way or the other. Um, so unfortunately, uh, one thing that I do sort of have a problem is that even now when people are reviewing the story of Hong Gil-tong that I translated, they describe it as a folk novel or folk story. It's not. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's, I mean, for it to be folk, it does kind of have to have its origin in oral storytelling and all that. But this is not in any way can be described as a folk tale because the work that is, exists right now is a result of some literate writer sitting down in his study with brush and ink and, and just coming out and composing this uh, work. Um, again, is it possible that he may, there may have been an oral tradition that, from which he heard and then he wrote it down? Sure, why not? <laughs> uh, but I, I think it's really beyond the realm of what's allowable for scholar to make a statement like that when there's an absolute and complete lack of evidence uh, for that. Right? Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. Well, well, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, I, I wouldn't know about America because I think I, you know, this, this, uh, my translation has just come out, so there's there probably significantly more numbers of people. Uh, uh, I, I cannot give a rough, a rough estimate, but I, I'm pretty confident that I can tell you that. Um, if, if you're South Korean, there's no way you have not heard of this story, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it, it would be the same thing that if you had asked me, uh, asked an English scholar, well, roughly how many English people know about Robin Hood, right? Well, everybody does, right? Uh, but that's a different thing altogether from saying, well, how many people have read those medieval ballads? Right? And I would say very few. I mean, it's like, I, I would be surprised if it was, I mean, it would, be, it would probably be less than, less than 10%. And I would be, um, I, I would think that the, uh, the, uh, the percentage of South Koreans who've actually uh, read the entirety of the story of Hong Gil-dong would be that or even less. I mean, this is, uh, I also because, um, you know, as, as one of the uh, professors at Yonsei University told me, even for modern Koreans, classic Korean literature is like a, it's like a foreign language. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's, it's really hard to read and, uh, and so on. So not many people do, but uh, so, you know, to answer your question, I think the familiarity of what people think that they know about the story of Hong Gil-dong is universal, right? Uh, but the actual numbers of people who got that knowledge to reading the work is very, very few, right? And I, I, would, I would probably think about, you know, the people of La Mancha having <laughs> read Don Quixote, right? Uh, now, North Korea, I don't know about, but, um, uh, my, the second half of my book is actually all about modern adaptations of the story of Hong Gil-dong in many different versions, in, in new novels, in TV dramas, and movies. Um, I found this spectacular North Korean film version of the story of Hong Gil-dong that's available on YouTube. Uh, and, and, and the whole story behind it is completely bizarre because um, what, you know, the people who are involved in this pro uh, project were these two South Korean directors who were kidnapped by Kim Jong-il and forced to make films in North Korea, right? And, uh, uh, and, it's, uh, and it's, it's really interesting, it's really bizarre. So what that tells me that there is a, or even in North Korea, there is an understanding, and my guess is that they probably took Kim Tae-jun's you know, proto-socialist, anti-feudalist versions of it. And uh, in the film itself, there's, a, there's a, something that's so quintessentially Korean because um, at the end of the Hong Gil-dong movie that, that was produced in North Korea, Japanese ninjas show up. <laughs> I mean, Japanese ninjas, right? I mean, and it's like, I mean, that's not in the story at all. That just added. It just turned out that these Japanese ninjas are coming into Joseon Dainy to steal treasures and steal Korean women, right? And, uh, uh, and in a way, this is so North Korean. <laughs> this is just so North Korean, right? Uh, the xenophobia, the anti-Japanese uh, sentiment and, uh, and all that, right? Uh, but it's uh, uh, but it's it's a really interesting work. So so my guess is that uh, the the, um, the particular like socialist take on the story of Hong Gil Dong will probably be universally known in North Korea as well. One last question. Uh, okay. Yeah. 
Um, I had another, well, the first question, actually, you just answered it. Uh-huh. Um, I was going to ask about how, uh, what more modern versions of, of the story, like what sort of changes have they made um, mm-hmm. in, like in South Korea? Uh-huh. Have, have there been like more shifts at times between say like, uh, like emphasizing the, you know, the action or, yeah. or other parts of the story? Yeah. Uh, yeah. They, they all tend to really completely depart from the story. Um, you know what? I'll go through this really, really quickly, right? Because I, 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 I compile all these images of modern versions of it, right? Um, and this is, this is actually from a Japanese era si- silent movie version. And what's really to me interesting is that Hong Gil Dong commits suicide at the end. Right? And it's one of the ways in which I analyze it. It's, it's what I call the limits of resistance on the Japanese rule, right? That's only so much you can do, but he, he kills it. So it ends with a huge tragedy. Uh, and that's, uh, that's uh, Hong Gil Dong and his mother. Um, and, uh, uh, and here is the uh, um, you know, comic book version that's really famous. It's universally known uh, in South Korea. And there, it's an emphasis, uh, it's for children, it's a comic book, but so their emphasis on action, and also, they interestingly turn him into not so much a rebel, but a kind of a patriot, because the idea that when you live under unjust rule, the most patriotic thing you can do is to rebel, right? And uh, uh, so this, uh, and I, I actually translated parts of this in the journal Azalea of, of the comic book versions, um, and this, the famous, another, that, that he's, I mean, this is the iconic image. Um, and uh, uh, this is the, and this is the North Korean Hong Gil-dong, right? and uh, he's fighting with uh, these people and ninjas, <laughs> right? All of a sudden, he's fighting Japanese ninjas, right? Uh, and at the end, it, it ends with him leaving Joseon Dynasty to look for a socialist paradise somewhere out in the uh, out in the sea. Right? Uh, uh, this is the uh, the the, the um, contemporary Korean um, uh, dra- drama that was made, and it's it's really a lot of fun. But it's, uh, um, th- there's, a, there's a particular time of Korean drama um, called Fusion Saguk, right? Which, which, is, uh, which is a historical drama where they throw historically accuracy out the window and just mix in modern element. He's wearing sunglasses, <laughs> right? And, it's, uh, and, it's, it's, it has a, and the music is K-pop. Uh, in the background, and it's it's uh, and they're all you know they, they and uh, acting and dating and so on, right? So very attractive actors and so on. Um, by the way, that that dude is in trouble because of sexual harassment issues. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this is a modern version called uh, Descendants of Hong Tong. It's about a group of modern day uh, bandits who go after corporate heads because they are descendants of Hong Tong. <laughs> And they, they steal all this money and then give it away. It's, 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 it's a kind of cool, fun action movie. Uh, and you can find it on Netflix. Um, and, uh, oh, uh, this is, uh, oh, God, I, I can't go into this, but there's a town called Changsong in Chungcheong province. Uh, and they came out with this cockamamie idea that this is the hometown of Hong Tong, that Hong Tong comes from their town. And uh, during the 90s, the Korean government really encouraged all local uh, gov- governments to up their local tourism. And they all had to get some theme. And the idea was that it is going to be home of Hong Tong, right? So this, this statue is there when you go, come out of the airport. I, I mean, I'm sorry, the train station. And uh, they created this sort of you know, anime style <laughs> cartoon versions of it, Hong Tong and friends. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, they, so, and, this is, and they built an entire park. Um, so they built Hong Tong's house. <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I mean, if you, if you look around, it's made from concrete and all that. So the thing is, I mean, I, look, I, this is the site of a uh, illustrious Hong family who were illustrious statesmen during the Joseon Dynasty. Um, and uh, so they just built this house just and said that this is where Hong Tong, the real life Hong Tong, comes from. But the, the thing that, I mean, to, to answer your question, the thing that really disturbed me the most was that in the placard where you see Hong Tong's father and Hong Tong he's kneeling down and he's about to go off on his adventures. On the placard, it says, Hong Giltong's father exhorts him to go out there and save the people and fight against corruption, right? Now, if you read a novel, it's exactly the opposite, right? Hong Giltong defies his father, right? But this, this park is for kids. So you can't tell them, that, tell little kids that this hero defied his father. So they distorted the entire thing to make it seem as if Hong Tong's adventure began as a result of obeying his father's order to go out there and help the poor. Right? Uh, so uh, yeah, so I so I went there and I you know and, and went through diff- different versions of it and so on. Right? 
Thank you so much. Um, we do have the translation available for sale tonight. And if you have any additional questions, please remain. But thank you so much for coming tonight. And thank you, Professor Kang, for your lecture. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming.